Hey everyone, Mr. Piano Tech here, and today I'm going to show you how to regulate a grand piano. So there's a lot of information out there on regulating a piano action, especially when it comes to a grand piano. It can be a bit confusing not knowing where to start and which methods to use. So today I'm going to show you the 12 steps that I use to regulate a grand piano action. These steps I use on a very regular basis to perform a regulation on a grand piano. So without anything further, let's head on to the shop and get started. Okay, so we're out here in the shop now and the first thing I want to show you is the regulation table. Now I built this table because I do a lot of regulations, um, but I did for years use one of the let off racks like this one here, they're pretty readily available and they do a pretty good job. If you only do a little bit of regulation, this should do just fine for you. Um, I ended up building this table because I do do a lot of regulations. Um, it started as a Husky tool table that's adjustable in height up and down. Um, and then I added all this to the back. So I, I cut for length and mounted a couple of um, levels um, so that way I can adjust the bass section and the treble section all at once and I never had to move anything once it started. Um, I also know it's a perfectly level um, platform as the wood has a piece of steel in it as well so it's not going to warp or anything over time. So if you do a lot of regulations um, I highly recommend uh, maybe building something similar or uh, just having a dedicated space to work on regulations. Um, okay, so the tools that you're going to need, um, I start with this. Now what I use with this is just a piece of steel with, um, actually a little piece of aluminum with uh, some tape on it. And what I do with this is that I put this in the piano once I pull the action out to mark the string height. So I will slide this in between the strings, mark it up on the treble side, and then I'll do it again, of course, in the bass end as the bass strings will sit a little bit higher. So this way there's no uh, messing about with any uh, measurements or anything. I just mark it exactly where the height is um, in the piano. So next uh, we have the uh, multi-measurement tool here. This gives us a few different measurements, um, starting with, uh, I'll give you the measurement for the, uh, the hammer to string distance, as well as the let off, the dip, and back check. And then we have a metric ruler uh, for var uh, measuring various different things like key height and such. Um, then we have the bedding tool with a little strip of paper and a strip of sandpaper. We have the dip block. I modified this to be exactly 10 millimeters. It's a good starting point. Then we have traveling paper or traveling tape. And we have some open-ended wrenches for the capstan, which will adjust the hammer height. Um, some need the open-end wrench and some just have a capstan screw with a hole in it, which is what this other tool is, is useful for. And we have a spring tool for adjusting the tension of the repetition spring. Sometimes that's adjusted actually with a little um, flathead screwdriver, which is why I have that. And then we have some slotted tools, uh, a few different sizes. Um, and what these are used for is anything from knuckle alignment, uh, drop, let off, depends on the, the piano action. And here we have a couple of wire benders. Uh, this one's pretty commonly used to, um, to bend back checks. And this one um, I really enjoy using for uh, when I have to adjust uh, the bend in a damper head. If it's the string's ringing out a little bit, uh, you may just need to line up the damper head with the string, and that works really well for that. And then a couple screwdrivers, um, Phillips head number two, and then a, a combination handle with a flange screwdriver in it. And then we have some um, uh, little tweezers here uh, for placing and taking out punchings. Um, the punchings over here are for the front rail for your key dip, um, and these are for the center rail for the key height. And then I always keep on hand some uh, Protec CLP lube, uh, just to make sure everything's lubricated, there's no squeaks or noises coming from anything. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, move on to the action. Okay, so let's uh, get started here by taking a look at bedding. 
So the bedding tool that I showed you before here, um, actually it doesn't work with this action. This one uh, just has, uh, gives us a little flathead uh, screw, which is, which is fine, which is super easy to deal with. Uh, but a lot of them will have these little stems that come up and you just put this tool over the stem, screw it down and uh, back it out as needed. And it has a couple extra little guys here on it. So um, underneath uh, the, the front, sometimes we'll have screws underneath and it just has a couple little holes and that's what you use these for. Again, just to back it out or screw it up in as needed. So you can do the bedding with the keys in the action or with the keys out of the action. It's quite a bit easier to do it if you do pull the, if you go ahead and first remove the stack uh, from the action and then pull the keys out. It's a little bit easier to do it, but um, you can do it this way. And um, I'm actually just gonna uh, show you with the keys in right now. So <clears throat> the reason why I recommended uh, use a little, um, little piece of paper here. So what you're gonna to wanna to do is if you tap on this, it's making a tapping sound. So we know that this screw, which has a, a little plate at the bottom of it, isn't down far enough to contact this. So it's just resting on different pieces of the wood. So what you wanna do is just put a piece of paper under it where you can see it's passing underneath that. And then uh, we'll, we'll screw it down little by little until we can feel that it's starting to grab the paper. Okay, so there we know we're close because I can feel it dragging it. So what you still hear, a little tapping sound. So if we go in here and we tighten it down just a little bit more, that sound is gone. It's just the sound of me pushing on this. So that's, that's bedded tight. So we know that the bottom of this screw is perfectly flush with this. Um, and so then what you will do is go ahead and do all of them. Um, the ones up front can be a little bit different. Like I said, you can use that tool to have the screws that are built into it just to kind of back it down. But a lot of pianos, um, including Yamahas, uh, they don't have those up front. So what they have um, is, is you'll just have to take a piece of sandpaper and you'll have to look at the front of it and see where it's higher, where there's a little bit of a gap between the frame and, um, and the, the bed here that you're using as a platform. And uh, you'll go down to where it's, um, it's contacting it and you're just gonna basically pull um, the sandpaper through those spots and you're just gonna kind of barely sand the front of it like that out, um, just to make sure that it, it gets leveled out in the front. I usually use a little strip of 220. It um, usually does pretty well. Okay, so key height. So the height of the, the white keys here, uh, it's usually going to be between 64 or 65 millimeters thereabouts. Some larger pianos will be a little bit higher, maybe 66, um, maybe even uh, 63, 62. It just depends a lot on the action. Uh, but you'll measure underneath the, f the front of, of the, uh, the key cap there. So right at the bottom underneath that is where you're actually going to be measuring. So get that 64, 65 millimeters there about. Like I said, it's a pretty good starting point. Um, and if you need to bring it up um, or down some, um, simply lift it up, use your tweezers, and get that, um, the felt punching off first, and then uh, adjust your height with the other ones as needed. Just make sure the felt one stays on top when you put it all back together because the movement of this key back and forth over time will just completely destroy any paper you put under there. That's why the felt's there to keep it moving smoothly and to protect the paper punchings. Um, so you don't want this um, center, center pin um, like buried into the bushing like that. That's gonna be way too high. You need to have some out so we can rock back and forth. Now when it comes to uh, the sharps, uh, typically the sharps are gonna be right at uh, 12 millimeters um, at the front above the white keys. Um, that's pretty standard uh, for most pianos. So as long as this is set right for, for underneath here, um, low 60 millimeters, and then um, 12 millimeters at the front of this black key, um, the, uh, um, the key height should be set pretty well. Okay, so on to dip. Um, now, again, I modified this block to be 10 millimeters. Uh, so what you do is you just push it down on top of the key and it should be flush and level with the one next to it, which this one is. Um, if it's not, you can, uh, again, pull that felt up and uh, take out some punchings or add some as needed. Um, and then just, again, make sure that felt stays on top again. Um, this can be uh, played with a little bit, the dip, uh, when it comes to aftertouch, which I'll go over later. Um, so the, the, the dip and the, uh, the hammer to string uh, distance can be altered some just to, to get the right feel of the action. Okay, so when it comes to dip on the black keys, um, it's important to note that uh, the best way to figure that is you want the same rise in the back of the black key as you do on the white key. So um, if you take 
uh, spot back here and you measure how far it comes up, um, this one should be coming up the same amount. Um, and then that, that way you know uh, that the, the dip for the black key is set properly. Okay, so step number four is gonna be hammer travel. Uh, this is important because we want the hammer to strike the string squarely. Um, and it's better to set this now so that we can also, uh, so it makes it easier to, to set the, uh, the hammer to string distance uh, when we know that these are traveling properly. So <clears throat> basically what you do is uh, just take a screwdriver or something, go underneath um, a handful of the hammers, lift them up and down like this. Um, when doing this, you'll be able to see if some of them head off to the left or head off to the right uh, while doing that. And uh, all you'll do simply is, let's say this uh, hammer here is heading off to the left. So if it is, we will just uh, unscrew the flange and remove the screw. We'll take some of our traveling paper, which is basically just uh, masking tape that's cut really thin. And we'll take a little piece of it. And if it's heading off to the left, we want to tape the left. So we'll tape the left side here and put the screw back in it. Make sure everything is aligned right. And then uh, recheck. All right, so it looks good. Looks really good. Okay, so <clears throat> if it's heading to the left, tape the left side. If it's heading off to the right, tape the right side. So sometimes uh, you'll notice that a hammer head is twisted one way or the other while it's just sitting here. So if that, um, happens, all you need to do is just use a little heat gun um, and you'll do what's called burning the shanks. Try not to actually burn them though. So what you'll do, is, let's say this is twisting to the left, I would apply a little bit of pressure to the right, um, use the heat gun um, on this part of the shank here. And just hold it there for usually about 10 seconds. You'll feel it twist in your hand and just let it go and it'll, it'll twist a little bit over and it should stay there. So number five is going to be hammer distance. Um, a good place to start is right around 46 millimeters. Uh, usually between 42 and 46 is where you'll end up. Uh, this gauge between here and here is measured at 46. Uh, I also have a marking for myself for 42. It just depends on the, the action type um, and just the way it's designed and built. Um, you can also play with that a little bit uh, for adjusting after touch. Again, like I said before about adjusting dip. Um, we'll give you similar results, but I'll, I'll go into that when I go over after touch. So, uh, so again, this gauge is set for 46 millimeters. That's a good starting point. What you don't want is you don't want this hammer shank resting on this rail. In rare cases, somebody may have just set this rail too high, but usually what that means is if this is laying down here, it needs to be regulated because it shouldn't be resting on that. The weight of this should be resting on this whip and assembly here, not on that back belt. That's just to stop it from striking whip and parts when it swings back down after a strike. Uh, so, <clears throat> Again, between uh, 42, 46 millimeter. Uh, this action is great because this, this frame rail here actually gives us a cutout where we can see a couple of different things I need to show you. So if you're adjusting the, uh, the hammer um, to string distance, uh, you adjust it with that little uh, capstan screw down there. Uh, sometimes it'll just have a hole in it uh, f uh, to be used for adjustment. And that's when you use one of these tools here just to put it in the hole back here and uh, twist it whichever way you need it to go. Uh, this one actually needs us to use the open end wrench, this guy here. Uh, so basically all you do, um, just get back in here with the wrench and you'll see when I unscrew it, the hammer comes up and when I screw it in, it goes down, up and down like that. So that's how you adjust the height of these. And all you need to do is just put your gauge up there and uh, get good and eye level with it and just bring it up to you're at the right height. And I'll usually uh, adjust a little bit and strike it, adjust it and strike it, just to let everything kind of reset in there. Okay, so number six is going to be repetition lever. Um, the, the tension on it, this is important, and I, I recommend doing this now, because if you try to do drop first, if this is way too weak, you're not gonna get proper, proper readings off of it. So uh, basically what you wanna look for is if you strike the string, and it checks itself, lift off, slowly lift off the front of the key just a little bit, and you'll see that. So <clears throat> on a lot of pianos, including Yamaha's, 
this will just it'll this won't be here this screw and this it won't look like this there'll be a spring that tucks itself up under here use the spring tool to sling it out and it'll try to curve its way this way and you can just help it push it that way a little bit just to stretch it out a little um, and then put it back under there again this one actually um, has a little screw head just uh, lift the hammer up out of the way screw it down to tighten it or back it out some to loosen it uh, what you don't want is you don't want this so strong that when you let off you, you see it bounce or that you can feel it in the key so you should just be able to, to see it happen like that but you shouldn't be able to feel it happen okay step number seven is going to be knuckle alignment <laughs> so basically all you need to do to see that just push this repetition lever down and you want the back of this jack to line up with the back of the mortise here on, on this this little piece of wood here in the knuckle um, and so just lift that and see if they line up um, this one's a, this one's pretty good but uh, we'll still make some adjustments anyway so that's adjusted uh, by this screw right here so if you screw it in tightening it in that way the jack is going to move towards you if you loosen it it's going to move away from you so just work it in here sometimes you need to, need to lift this up by hand a little bit uh, to get at the right angle but uh, so if you watch it it moves towards me and away from me depending on which way i twist this like that so just uh take a look at that that's actually pretty squared up okay so number eight is going to be drop uh, drop is typically um, four millimeters or twice the measurement for let off um, it's important we do this next because you won't be able to see or feel drop if the let off is set way too high um, so i just recommend doing this now so on this gauge that's your drop measurement there that's four millimeters wide and you'll see your drop by striking it let it go let the repetition lever do its thing that's why it's good to do the repetition lever first and then when it's done swinging itself back up that's where your drop should be and that's right at four millimeters so to adjust it sometimes there's a little flathead screw on the top of this uh, on this one it just has this little little nib here for uh, the slotted adjustment so if you notice when i screw it down um, or screw it up it'll it'll bring the uh, hammer like that up and down so just make sure it's not grabbing the back check or it won't move at all so just adjust that to where you're at, at four millimeters away so that will allow the, the hammer to stay away from the vibrating string after you strike it. Okay, number nine is gonna be let off. Um, I recommend uh, two millimeters for that. And on this gauge, it's this little guy right here. So you're just gonna go up and make sure that it's letting off right at two millimeters, which this one is. And to adjust that, um, we need to adjust this little guy right here. So on this action, it, uh, it just needs this tool because it has the holes in it. So if you need it to get closer before cutting out, bring the, the screw it in up this way because this jack movement is, is what's gonna control that. So um, this is the number one um, thing you can adjust when someone says they have a heavy action. So over time, after, when all these components compress, you know, the let off may be like way out here and that person's having to hit the string that much harder to get it to swing up and hit the string, you know, having hit, it's having hit the key that much harder to get it to hit the string. So, uh, bringing that close um, will make a bit of, a big difference in someone's the action and the way that it feels. So, just bring that up, and if we need it to be uh, closer, you know, tighten it up. If we want it to be uh, a little further away, just loosen it down a little bit. I usually work in like quarter turns until that's just right. And, uh, once it uh, cuts out right where it needs to, that's a little I left that a little too close. Looks good right there. Okay, number 10 is going to be back check. Um, again, multi-tool. This is measured at 15 millimeters. Uh, that's going to be a really good uh, uh, starting point for how far away that hammer should be when it checks. Um, it's a little little close. Actually, yeah. You can strike it a few different ways. Um, it's pretty good. It's a little close, but <clears throat> you want that the tail of this uh, hammer to end up somewhere right around halfway down this back check is usually a good starting point as well. So if you need to adjust it further away, just push it away some so it'll drop down further. And if you need it closer, uh, just pull it up 
towards you. And it, uh, again, you can use a little bending tool or you can uh, just get the hammer out of the way and just uh, bend this a little bit. Just make sure you're bending as low as possible. So number 11 is going to be after touch. So this is what you feel after everything's done its job in the action. So after you press the key and you get the let off and you have the checking and you have the drop, it's this little bit of extra movement. So again, play through it and you have this movement here. This is your after touch. If there's no after touch, it's gonna to be very uncomfortable to play. Um, and it's also sometimes you have to keep pressing down really hard to get that jack to come all the way out and to do its job. So um, if there's not enough after touch, um, you can um, increase the dip. So the front, if you, if you let the front of the key dip down more, it'll allow more movement of this, this key assembly so you have more to play with. Um, alternatively, you could reduce the hammer to string distance. So if, if it's starting um, here versus here, you're gonna have that much more uh, key room to play with. So if you're, at, say you're like 46 and you have like almost no after touch, maybe move it to 44, even down to 42. Um, so you have that much more room to play with. And number 12 is going to be dampers. I can't show you in this, um, in this setup here because we don't have a, a model to show it on, but um, a couple things you need to look out for on dampers. So first of all, a big complaint is that the damper isn't doing its job. It's not dampering the, the tone out when the string is vibrating. So if you, hit a, if you hit a key and it keeps ringing out a little bit and your sound's halfway cut off or muffled, um, there's a good chance that it's not squared up on the string. So um, the damper will typically either be um, bent to the left or to the right or to the front or to the back. So you pull the action, unscrew it, pull the, the damper out, and I always lay it down and make sure that it's squared up. That's what I use this tool here for. If I need to bend that uh, damper wire in a specific direction, I use that squared up. So long as the felt's good um, and it's squared up, it should be doing its job. If it's still not, check the felt, make sure the felt's good. If it's uh, pretty old and hard, it's not gonna do its job. So the other thing with dampers is um, when does it rise? So usually at about a, a half a, of a hammer movement, uh, a third to a half of movement through this motion, you should start seeing that damper rise. So, you know, if you're pressing this key, you should, damper should start rising like, you know, right around there. Um, usually, like I said, about a third to halfway, that damper should be lifting up. And my final checks, uh, check over everything, play through it, make sure it feels good. After touch feels good, nothing's binding, nothing's creaking, nothing's making noise, no tapping, none of that. Um, if you do have tapping, that's usually a loose hammer. It's either the head that's loose or the screw is loose. Um, creaking, it's, it's pretty common for these knuckles to creak, for the jack to creak against that knuckle when it's trying to slide out of the way. You may need to use some... Uh, and Teflon powder and baby powder works really well to lubricate those. Um, if you do have graphite, you can paint on there. That'd be fine as well. Uh, so just do a good um, overall check. Make sure everything's uh, fluid and working properly. So that's it. Hopefully this demystified the process for you. Again, there's a lot of different methods out there, but these are the 12 steps that I use on a very regular basis to regulate a grand piano action. And again, the 12 steps are listed below for easy reference, as well as the five steps I recommend if you need to do a quick regulation in someone's home to get some immediate results. So any comments, questions, snide remarks, leave them below, and as always, stay tuned.